Uh, extend a special thanks to uh, the president of Hartnell College, Dr. Llewellyn, for graciously hosting this event. Um, this, this tonight re uh, represents the final installment of our 2015 four-part racial justice speaker series, which we c are calling Courageous Conversations. And I feel like now more than ever, that name is, is really ex exceedingly relevant, if not urgent, not uh, appropriate for young people. Uh, as um, he implied, as antithetical to academia. And I would heartily disagree with that. As probably a lot of you know, in Monterey County, uh, 57, almost 58% of Monterey County's population self-identifies as having origins of Latino or Hispanic heritage. And across the country right now, Latinos constitute 17% of the nation's demographic, and that's rising very quickly. And I would assert that if we cannot have a, a measured, meaningful, courageous conversation ourselves about the barriers that affect so many of our local residents and um, national citizens, if we can't address that, we are not half of the community or the nation that we assert ourselves to be. Um, I would also assert that the current anti-immigration climate in the US I find very troubling right now. The rhetoric of some of the contenders for the most powerful leadership position in the free world, uh, the divisive statements coming from campaigns that insult Latinos and insult immigrants that are inflammatory, I find unacceptable. It's this lowest common denominator above which, above which we must rise. And indeed, uh, promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity to all is essential and vital to the YWCA's mission. So I think it's very appropriate that we address this issue. Barriers to citizenship, barriers to upward mobility, to home ownership, to a college education, all of these things are very relevant. So, it's time for us to have a courageous conversation of our own. And my hope is that after Dr. Vasquez uh, speaks tonight, that you will take her message and have a courageous conversation of your own, perhaps tomorrow or sometime in the future after you've reflected on what you've heard here tonight with your colleagues, your classmates, your neighbors, your friends. So, enjoy the presentation. And uh, with, that, with that, I would like to introduce Rosemary Soto, YWCA Monterey County's fabulous board member, Rosemary. Good evening, and thank you everyone for being here, for taking the time out of your, your busy uh, weekday. And um, I think that I, I can echo our, um, our director's words of this topic coming at a very timely um, at a very appropriate time, and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jessica Vasquez. Uh, I would like to start with sharing with you a little bit about her. Um, Jessica Vasquez is, a, is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Oregon. She received her sociology doctorate from the University of California, Berkeley in 2007. She was assistant professor of sociology at the University of Kansas before moving west to the University of Oregon in 2013. Her scholarship focuses on race, ethnicity, Mexican-Americans and Latinos, migration, gender, and family. She is the author of Mexican-Americans Across Generations, Immigrant Families, Racial Realities, which was published by the New York University Press in 2011. After the publication of her first book, Dr. Vasquez won fellowships from the Russell Sage Foundation and the Ford Foundation to dedicate time to writing her second book on Latino family formation. This second book uses interviews with Latinos and their spouses, both Latinos and non-Latinos in California and Kansas, to examine how people choose to marry each other and the consequences of those decisions on the people's understandings of race and ethnicity. <clears throat> 
She and her co-author won the Best Article Award from the Latino Latina Sociology Section of the American Sociological Association. Her research has been reproduced in part as an exemplar of qualitative methodology in a research methods textbook produced by Oxford University Press. Her most recent article, entitled Discipline Preferences, published in the journal Social Problems, draws out the racist mechanisms that produce high rates of Latina, Latinos intra-group marriage. Vasquez has published in numerous sociology and interdisciplinary journals, gives lectures across the nation, and continues to teach and research in the areas of race, Latinos, and international migration. Please join me with an applause and welcome Dr. Jessica Vasquez. Well, that was exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much for your hearty welcome, um, and thank you to YWCA and Hartnell College for inviting me, and Cheryl, you've been amazing to work with, as I mentioned. Um, this has been a wonderful uh, visit so far, and I look forward to uh, sharing with you some of the work that I've been doing, and also starting to engage in that conversation that Cheryl was talking about during the uh, Q&A, and I should warn you, feel free to give me a little signal when I should be wrapping up. I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> Okay. So yes, I am very much all about talking about race, uh, including Latinos, racism, and mobility, as you'll hear about today. So my interest in Latinos generally comes in part biographically from the fact that I'm uh, Mexican-American descent, as well as um, have a mother who's European white uh, descent. So I grew up in Santa Barbara. Everybody kind of looked like me. I felt like I mixed in whatever community in Santa Barbara that I was um, in at the time. So I think my research is, you know, tied to my own personal biography in a way. Um, and I hope that those of you um, in the audience can kind of connect to what I'm going to talk about through, your, through whatever vantage point makes uh, sense in your own kind of interest area or biography as well. So my uh, research tends to engage this larger conversation in the United States about the long-term fate of Latinos in the United States. So the, the, de the debate about the future tends to coalesce around three angles. One is, will uh, Latinos become a near-permanent marginalized minority, much like blacks? Are they separatist and, try and conspiring for a reconquest of the Southwest, or of the nation more generally? Or third, will they eventually assimilate like European origin white ethnics? And if so, how long might that take? So there's a concern here about the fragmenting of a presumed core white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation, which, by the way, forgets a lot of people and forgets a kind of multinational um, and multicultural society. So as Cheryl mentioned, um, part of the state is fueled by population de demographics changing. Uh, Latinos now outnumber blacks as the largest minority group. Uh, Latinos number 17% of the nation's uh, population, whereas blacks now stand at 16%. So in terms of the scholarship on Latinos in the United States, um, I like this quote. Um, I'll focus on the left-hand one um, because it talks about how this concern over, oh my goodness, society is changing based on demographics um, and that fear. Um, this quotation on the left really talks about how that nativistic concern or that xenophobic kind of anti-foreigner concern or reasoning is problematic because it anticipates a single predominant outcome for group members, meaning Mexican Americans or Latinos, such as assimilation or racialized exclusion. Instead, it is the diversity within groups of, patter within groups of patterns of incorporation into American society that needs recognition today. So my research enters there. So I talk about it's not just a group will either assimilate or become racialized um, and excluded, it's diversity within a group that matters, and that's what I'm trying to tease out in my research. So the orienting questions of my research are uh, principally, how does race matter in the lives of Latinos, 
So more specifically, I want to look at things like socioeconomic mobility, what's going on there. I was frustrated uh, a number of years back when I was designing this research because I would be walking down Barnes & Noble when Barnes & Noble existed, and I would go to the Latino section, and everything on the shelf was about uh, poverty and gangs. And I thought, but wait a minute, that doesn't actually mirror my experience. I consider myself Latina. So I want to investigate that. Let's think about the broader category and not just focus on one small segment, but let's honor the group diversity. So also I want to investigate the integration into US mainstream society. As I tell my undergrads, as I'm sure you, we all know, right? Um, not all Latinos are immigrants. Similarly, not all immigrants are Latinos, right? So it's a pretty basic, basic point, and yet it's important, I think, you know, we hear presidential debates, as uh, Cheryl was referring to, and that those differences start to collapse. So I want to look at integration. So you'll see that I actually did a project where I looked at generations, I looked at families and looked at change across generations. Uh, I'm also really interested in racial and ethnic identity. So how it gets transmitted or transformed across generations and families. And then my newest project is on family formation. So who chooses to marry whom? and why, and kind of how that works out in terms of race and culture. So I'm principally going to be talking about my first study uh, today, but I want to kind of forecast, um, give a little bit of a teaser for the second study, which will become a book eventually um, out in press. So the first study, which is uh, the book that's out there for sale, which I'm happy to sign and chat with you about, uh, the first study was conducted here in California. I had two field sites. I worked in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was at UC Berkeley as a graduate student at the time. And then I mentioned I'm from Santa Barbara, so I had interview interviewees from in and around Santa Barbara County. So what I did here is I interviewed people who were in the same family. So I had 69, actually, interviews. Um, and I interviewed the first generation immigrants. You can tell because they were elderly. I have a small sample there of only eight people who were first generation immigrants because they were uh, in the age range of 65 to 88. Uh, the median age, meaning if you line them up from uh, oldest age to youngest age, the middle would be 83. So I have eight first generation immigrants. So the second generation is their US born children because I wanted to hold generation constant, meaning that I wanted people of particular generations in the United States. So the second generation are US born uh, to the Mexican immigrant. And then the third generation is, again, the child of the US born second generation. So the grandchild of this first generation. So that was actually kind of hard to access that many families where you had first, second, and third generation living and willing to talk to you. Um, so I consider that a little bit of a feat. Um, so roughly equal numbers of males and females. Uh, you can see the age range here gives you a sense of you know, how old people were. Same thing with median age. Uh, adolescence, I just wrote that because I will be making a point about um, historical era and how the generation or the historical moment in which people um, can lived or live, how that matters. So that's why I have uh, adolescents up there to give you a sense of, uh, oops, when people lived. Just kidding, wrong direction. Okay. Uh, oh, I should note that in this first study that this, the families that I interviewed, so these were in-depth interviews, um, they were done usually separately, one, meaning one-on-one. -on -one. So the families themselves were middle class by definitely the third generation. Um, a lot of them were middle class by the second generation. So most of them had some sort of college education, or if not college education, um, a professional degree or an income, that a household income that allowed them to be kind of middle class according to the standards in sociology. So the second study, and I don't want to bore you all with you know, the technicalities, but just to give you a sense of who I interviewed for the second study, um, these were couples, because again, I was looking at family formation, where at least one person in the heterosexual couple, I didn't interview homosexuals, um, at least one person identified as Latino or Latina. I interviewed 109 people. And this interview, um, these interviews took place in northeastern Kansas, because I was a faculty member at University of Kansas at the time, or they took place in Los Angeles County. So I did that because there's obviously very different racial populations in northeastern Kansas, which is predominantly white at 85%, um, and LA County, which as you know is much more diverse. Uh, 
let's see. So yeah, 109 people and a subset of them had children that I, I was able to get access to an interview. And then this just simply gives you a sense of I interviewed people who were, so these are generally this, most often I got husbands and wives, uh, but sometimes I didn't get consent from a, a spouse. So most of these people were actually, of these 41 people were married to each other. So these would be Latino white partners. Um, so Lati a Latino married to a, a non-Hispanic white person. Also, I include um, Latinos who are married to non-Latino minorities. So those would be Asians, natives, and blacks. And then, of course, I have a large um, kind of subgroup of people who were married to other, La other Latinos. So that could be Mexican origin married to Mexican origin, or a Peruvian origin married to um, a Colombian origin person. So you have some kind of cross-national uh, pairings there. OK, moving on. So the goal of the talk today is to talk about, is to trace out mobility and racism. So I'll talk about the concepts of thin detachment and cultural maintenance from my first book. I'll talk about the importance of historical era. I'll talk about how gender matters. So it's not just about being Latino. It's about being a Latina woman, or it's about being a Latino man. I'll also talk about phenotypes. So physical characteristics often boil down to skin color. So phenotype matters. It's not just about being Latino. It's about being a light-skinned Latino or a dark-skinned Latino, or of course, somewhere in between. And then, of course, we'll get to, oh, I forgot to be clicking. My bad. Uh, <laughs> and then the point, um, ultimately being that, in the end, mobility and racism are co-occurring. So they're both occurring at the same time. OK, so I'll start with uh, a, a, the vignette that I used to open the first book, to open the first book. And so this, I would say, is kind of the common sense understanding of what goes on in families regarding race over generations. So interviewee from the first book, Paul Zagata, and I should note that's not his real name. I use fake names. So he answered my question about how the three generations in his family have changed with respect to racial identity. He enthusiastically launched into his Coca-Cola 7-Up and Evian water theory. So to him, the Mexican immigrant generation, so his parents, is the Coca-Cola generation because it, is, because it is rich in tradition and adheres to that tradition in a new context, meaning the United States. Immigrants' children, him, are the 7-Up generation because they lose some of the color of the culture and are more acculturated to the U.S. than their parents, the immigrants. The third generation, so the grandchildren of the immigrants, is the Evian water generation because it has lost both its color and its carbonation, or its cultural vibrancy, and it's wholesale become a part of the U.S. society, not to mention probably overpriced. <laughs> so I'll also note here um, how self-racializing this imagery is, right? It's very clearly talking about darkness going away over the generations. So Simon, who was a 30-something first-generation immigrant from Mexico, then entered the conversation at, um, that Paul and I were having at the workplace. What makes Simon different from the majority of immigrants from Mexico is that he's both educated and bilingual. Simon asks, well, what am I? Paul was puzzled over the fact of Simon's education, occupation, and class level. He was stumped. Maybe he's Diet Coke, I offered? <laughs> Paul affirmed, oh, I love it. Yeah, he's Coke, but a little bit different. Right? So even there, right, in that cute little analogy, you see that there's differences happening which is an argument against this wholesale assimilation versus racialization kind of s simplification. So while this um, kind of narrative is catchy and creative, um, this only tells part of the story. Uh, this is an assimilationist part of the story, and that's only one part of the story. You can certainly retain cultural attributes over generations. Uh, so, this so my research finds that Mexican immigrants, their children, and their grandchildren do in fact become increasingly embedded in the United States institutions and ways of life with each successive generation. Uh, so that's what we would call, sociologists would call structural integration. Yet there is substantial variability in the ways members of each generation experience and express their racial identity despite that structural integration. So it doesn't have to be kind of one way to be a part of U.S. society. So here, this is just a slide to let you know about the two kind of poles of a spectrum that I've uh, used to think about um, cultural incorporation possibilities. So on the left, we have what I call thin detachment. That's commitment to a knowledge of Mexican cultural practices, Catholicism in Spanish that weakens over generations. 
And then on the other hand, we have cultural maintenance where the family or the individual retains a high degree of Mexican cultural practices, Catholicism, and Spanish language through generations. Yet, of course, this is a spectrum. These aren't discrete categories, so you can certainly, you know, be somewhere in the middle. But it just helps to think about them as, as polar opposites in terms of writing a book and trying to theorize what's happening um, with immigrants over generations. So, regarding the importance of historical era, I'd like to introduce you to the Lopez family, who's headed by Juan, the 84-year-old immigrant, his son Marcus, who's 57, and his grandson Tony, who's 35. So Juan arrived in the U.S. as a young child in the early 1920s when Americanization programs aimed to mold immigrants into good Americans. Juan's young adulthood was a time when assimilation paradigms, labor recruitment, and deportation programs ordered the relationship between whites and Mexicans in the U.S. Marcus, the son, the second generation on the other hand, was a young adult during the civil rights movement and was active in the movement as a brown beret, even serving as one of Cesar Chavez's bodyguards. Marcus is eloquent about the ideological or belief system conflicts that he had with his, fathers, with his father, ideologies that were shaped by particular historical moments or historical eras. So Marcus says, I remember one time my, da I remember one time my dad smashed all his fingers trying to change a plow apparatus on the tractor. Yet he worked all afternoon. My dad thought that he owed, owed everything to the white man for what he had. He felt that the life he had was better than what life would be in Mexico. I used to tell him, what are you doing this for? They don't care about you. So he and I just had big differences. We got into knockdown, drag out fights about me being a brown beret. I was ungrateful, according to the father. We had big differences. So due in part to historical pressures, as well as, being, as well as his dual frame of reference as an immigrant, so comparing the current life he has in the U.S. with what he had in Mexico, Juan felt a debt of obligation to the U.S., which he repaid with a hearty work ethic, whereas Marcus grasped onto the language of civil rights and agitated for cultural citizenship during his growing up years, which were the 1960s. Which were the 1960s. So speaking of Marcus, who's the second generation, he encountered uh, institutional racism. So that would be racism that's embedded institutions and still squash um, the attempts at upward mobility um, or just livelihood of the minority. So Marcus uh, tells me, my high school counselor told me, told me I'd be nothing, that I should take nothing but shop classes because that's all that I was good for. That was all my people were good for, to be mechanics or cooks. That was one of my worst experiences because I was doing well in school and I wanted to get into honors classes. But when I went to see my counselor to ask him why I couldn't get harder classes or more classes besides three periods of study hall and a shop class, I was told by my counselor, take shop classes because your kind of people are good cooks and good mechanics. So clearly, right, people who were supposed to be on the side of students were selectively on the side of some students and working against other students. So that racist counselor detoured the education of Marcus based on negative stereotypes. So Marcus then left school, he entered the military, and then he earned his GED um, while in the military. So he tells me that later he went back to that same school, found that same counselor, and he had a bit of a you know, come to Jesus moment with, <laughs> with a, uh, that counselor. So I, I like to include this because it shows that while we can feel oppressed and in fact be, not just feel, but actually be blockaded by racism, there's still a way in which you can have agency, you do have power. Sometimes it takes decades to kind of come back and try to resurrect self-esteem and to kind of set the record straight. Um, so sometimes it's not immediate, but yet that still can happen. So Marcus tells me, I looked him straight in the eye and I said, I want my diploma and I want it backdated to 1964. He just looked at me and he says, well, I hope you learned to be a mechanic when you were in the service. I uh, know. I said, no, I was an instructor. I taught guerrilla warfare and hopefully I helped some of the guys come back from Vietnam. So he tells me, it made me very angry. Angry enough that when I got out of the service, I joined the Brown Berets. The Brown Berets were equivalent to the Black Panthers. I wanted to make change. So there are many things that are inspiring as well as 
baffling and saddening about uh, this story, and yet uh, all of them are important, right? If we think back to the title of the talk about Latinos, upward mobility, and racism, you see all of that happening right here, right? And what's important about historical moment, and actually probably also the fact that he's a male, is that the Brown Berets during the 60s were active. That was an outlet that was available to him that wasn't available to his father, right? So he was able to activate and be proactive and try to argue for that citizenship, that first class citizenship, in a way that was not available to his father. In addition, he was, of course, also more educated than his father, too. So there's lots going on here that shows that this family is gaining upper mobility, um, despite also encountering encountering some pretty serious blockades. So now we have the third generation. We've got Tony, who is the son of Marcus and also the grandson of Juan. So this is why I love doing multi-generational families. They're quite fun to see what's going on with all these people in the same family. So Tony tells me, and let's keep in mind Juan, who owed the white man in debt of gratitude, and let's keep in mind Marcus, who was told he would be a good uh, shop uh, mechanic or cook and gets his GED and comes back. And now we have Tony. who tell, He's a, a police officer, and he tells me, as far as getting into new jobs, new promotions, new positions, I think because I'm Hispanic and because I'm willing to work hard, so it's both, I think my race has kicked open a lot of doors for me. Employers pay me extra because I speak Spanish. I look at being Spanish as being ahead. Now, can you imagine either of the two men in that family saying the same thing? Right, no. Uh, so, unheard of a generation or two prior, Tony believes that his race has been advantageous to his career, right? So, he's talking about race and his Spanish abilities, uh, where is it? Uh, kicking open a lot of doors, whereas before we saw it was actually kicking people down, right? So, whereas his father, Marcus, was tracked into cooking and auto mechanics courses rather than academic ones, despite proven ability, uh, Tony began his career as a police officer after the civil rights policies were implemented. So there's actually been changes in federal law that support his uh, career. So what a difference a historical generation makes. In my terminology, Juan is thin detachment because he's trying to you know, not encounter uh, racism by being patriotic to the United States, whereas Marcus and Tony um, are cultural maintenance with history mediating their connection to their racial background, right? History allows for certain expressions at certain points in time. So the racial climate of historical eras can also become encoded within parent-child teachings. So the Madrigal family helps make this point. So Beatrice is a 60-year-old 60, 60 woman who's second generation, and she was assimilationist in her orientation. So her daughter, who's 35-year-old Reina, describes the historical reasons for her mother's assimilationist approach. So Reina tells me, because of the discrimination that occurred in the 1950s, um, this family lived in the LA area, by the way, my mom dropped off her cultural values. She didn't want me to experience discrimination, so I think that's why she said, I'm going to try to acculturate my daughters as much as I can. So the mother takes a, a kind of a, makes a project out of trying to integrate her daughters or prepare her daughters um, to be as best off as they can, you know, in the United States context, in, in LA, so that's why she didn't teach them Spanish. Well, Reina's younger, and she's raised in a different, kind of more pro-diversity environment, and so she has a different take on things. So third generation, Reina then, wants to recapture culture through her marital choice. So this is where gender and marriage comes in. So. Multicultural education, so that speaks to the importance of education and having multicultural classes. Multicultural education sparks interest in her ethnic background and ignites her desire to find a specifically Mexican husband. So this is the third generation Reina, who's 35. So she tells me, after I took the Chicano studies class is when I said, I want to marry someone Mexican. My husband is from Mexico and that is what I want to learn about, to know my culture because her mother didn't teach her, right? So he could help me. He could share some of the things about Mexico, what I was missing. So Reina attempts to recapture Mexican identity for herself through her Mexican national husband. Upon marriage, she acquires and then enacts Mexican practices in order to pass them on to her children, and less intentionally, she passes them to her mother. So while we typically think of information and cultural practices flowing down the generations from grandparent to grandchild or parent to child, um, the, the teaching 
kind of across generational rungs in the ladder actually can go up as well, you know, children teaching parents. Um, I will I'll also take a note just to say that it's this sort of kind of dynamic here that got me excited about doing my second project, which is squarely on marriage and why people choose to marry whom they do, and then what happens in terms of race and culture. So ethnic re-identification does not cease with Reina, but is transmitted up the generational ladder to her mother Beatrice, who, as we remember, shed cultural attributes at a historical moment of high discrimination. So Beatrice, Beatrice discusses her own cultural um, journey. So this is the six-year-old mother. When I married, I didn't know much about cooking. I could cook some, but I didn't know a lot or how to make tortillas. They looked like the shape of the United States, but they were edible. My mother never did that. I'm gradually going back to the way my ancestors cooked. I have a mocajete, and sometimes I get the chile, and I grind it. Maybe that's part of my Mexican coming out. Make tortillas, tamales, taquitos, or horchata. I learned from Rudy's mom, so that's her daughter's Mexican mother-in-law. She's helping me go back and do it the way my ancestors did it. Being around Rudy's mother, she's from Mexico and became a citizen, I'm learning through her the Mexican way. So even the imagery that Beatrice employs, so that of a misshapen homemade tortilla, makes it pretty clear that her reference point is the US. So a hallmark Mexican food is imperfect yet edible, and I think that gives us a little bit of insight into kind of cultural dynamism and how it can be somewhat messy. And I also want to touch on, since we've been t talking about kind of the importance of women in the last slide, kind of mother to, mother to daughter lines, I want to talk about women as carriers of culture. So turning to gender, I'd like to highlight how women can conceive of themselves uh, as carriers of culture, especially when it comes to child rearing. So there's also some external pressures on women to think of themselves this way, so there's a little bit of a dynamic there in terms of you know, where those ideas are coming from. So second generation Yolanda Segura is a mother who creatively renamed the classic fairy tale of Snow White into Snow Brown. So the protagonist in Snow Brown uh, is of Mexican origin and she speaks Spanish. So she does this for her, for her daughters, right, her brown-skinned half Mexican, half Puerto Rican daughters, in order to recalibrate the standards of beauty and to highlight bilingualism as an advantage for her children. So she says, I love being Mexican. I was able to stay home with our girls, so I have passed on my traditions, so they consider themselves Mexicanas first. So her daughter, Divina, whom I interviewed, got the message. Despite being half Puerto Rican on her father's side, because of her mom's thick representation of her culture, of her Mexican culture in her home, in her home Davina boils down her mixed ethnicity to the most dominant one, which is her mother's. As for men, it has been shown that violence is a masculine rite of passage, particularly for minorities. So I'd like to argue here that encounters with police is a male minority rite of passage, sad as that might be, and there's lots to talk about afterwards about more current events too. So interviewee third generation Pierre Mercado Ramirez tells me that he was racially profiled even though he was not performing race in stereotypical ways. So he was hanging out in a park uh, when this cop comes up to me, harassing me, asking me these questions about this piece of graffiti next to me that I hadn't even seen. I affiliated with the gothic subculture, so I was dressed in a velvet blazer and a bowler, and this guy is talking to me about graffiti. I'm wearing velvet. No cholos wear velvet. <laughs> I like that one, too. So he was actually at the park mourning the breakup of a romantic relationship, and so he was pretty startled, and then he got angry um, about this. So sociologists talk about social group membership as something that is performed. It is interesting, then, that even while Pierre Mercado performed a version of whiteness that is gothic, a police officer reassigned a label of Mexican-American to him, as well as implied criminality. So he wasn't actually able to successfully perform this version of whiteness that he wanted to. The police officer's refusal to accept Pierre Mercado's racial performance demonstrates the complexity of race and the complications that may arise when racial performances vary from what's expected. And in this case, also kind of forced stereotypes backed on him. So we also have people um, who I interviewed who were in the third generation who had 
who were wrestling with different sorts of issues. So here I'll flip to a woman um, whose pseudonym is Jillian Rosenberg. And so she wrestles with her identity. And her background is actually um, half non-Hispanic white and half Mexican-American. And so she grew up with that sort of biracial or mixed racial identity. She grew up in Santa Barbara, and her family was pretty kind of thin detachment. Um, she had a Mexican uh, origin, Mexican immigrant grandmother she spent a lot of time with when she was younger. She was very close to. Um, but she was raised in a Jewish home, despite her mom being Mexican-American. So she had a lot of cultural mixing going on in her, in her life. And so she's wrestling with the awareness of white privilege and then the denigration of Mexican heritage. So she says, I had really awful stereotypes of what Mexican people were like, too. Like all Mexican people are gardeners or maids. By the way, she's Mexican, right? So she laughs uncomfortably. There was always the half of me that I had to hide. I was always so embarrassed of that. I was soiled in some way because I had Mexican blood in me, right? So that's a horribly racist culture that this mixed race woman is contending with and having to figure out how to deal with. Um, so she says, maybe growing up I was trying to navigate between two worlds, but more trying to keep myself out of one of them as much as possible. Right? And so in this whole fight for justice and equality, we have to get over those things. And again, those are kind of social messages that are coming, which makes her feel that way. Um, and, she, and she, as again, a half Mexican American and half non-Hispanic white, also Jewish, you know, background, she's internalizing some of those, you know, stereotypes. And so she's got kind of an internal battle going on, um, again, reflecting a lot of what's going on from the outside in. So she also sees kind of as evidence of a racial hierarchy. Um, she sees this in her school classroom uh, or her school kind of system, her school building, I guess, the way it's set up. So one of the, so since desegregation, you have more, not all schools of course, but you have more integration, so you have more mixed schools, and yet, even within those supposedly diverse schools, you can have racially tracked classrooms, which is what she faced. So sure, her high school had a pretty diverse um, student population, between Mexicans and whites at least, and yet she found that the Mexican origin students were, were tracked into the regular classes and the white students were tracked in the advanced classes. So she tells me, in all of the gifted and talented education classes, everyone was white. There was a really clear-cut distinction between the white people and the Mexican people. If you were a Mexican kid, you were in ESL classes. I was in the gate classes with all the white kids, so I was white, right? So this comes after that debate over wait a minute, people are asking me what I am, I don't really know, but there's evidence that I'm kind of both, but then there are stereotypes and that I'm in this level classes, and not to mention her family, all the families, right, were middle class by the at least third generation, if not second generation. Uh, so there's a lot for, as we probably know, uh, people to contend with. So moving from here, I'd like to also think about um, skin color. So we've been sticking with a third generation, so our youth who were in their late teens to their very early 30s. So skin color is also really important. Skin color often serves as a proxy for race. So skin color is a visible physical characteristic that can prompt racial classification, assignment of meaning, as well as treatment. Skin color can, uh, has been found to correlate with income and education and is associated with honorary whiteness. So you have a third generation woman who tells me about an advantage of light skin. I think there are certain privileges to not looking stereotypically, stereotypically Mexican, right? There's also that stereotypically Mexican. There's lots of ways to look as well as to be any particular background. Things I take for granted, like not being followed in a store, not being labeled as somebody who doesn't have money. So there are class status implications. And then we have disadvantage of dark skin. So we have Tom Acevedo, bless his heart, he was a young teen when 9-11 uh, happened and he was walking across um, the schoolyard that was in between, it was either a schoolyard or a park, that was in between uh, his route that he was walking home to school on and his home, if that makes sense. Sorry, that was a little garbled. Um, so he was walking across uh, this park area in order to get home after 9-11, and he was stopped by a police person in this heightened kind of military aware um, moment after 9-11, and he says that after being investigated by 
uh, the police officer that he was pretty frightened and he says he might think I actually have a gun he was carrying a trombone he might actually think I have a gun and he might not trust me he might take me to jail I didn't want to get arrested for being Mexican right so he's thinking he's being racially profiled he's potentially being racially profiled given that it was 9-11 as Middle Eastern or Arab so there's a little cross discrimination going on yet it's still the dark skin and the fact of his maleness so you have gender and skin color interacting here and poor kid still was getting a little worked up as he was telling me this and I couldn't blame him and again a few years after um, was still moving for him so in terms of the pervasiveness of skin color I'd like to underscore here that I by the time we get to the third generation these folks are middle class they're doing well in high school they're on track to college and yet there's still a large um, degree of people reporting um, discrimination so to provide a measure of the pervasiveness of colorism I analyze reports of racial discrimination among these middle-class English-speaking educated third generation in the pie chart to the left we see that 59 percent of the third generation claim to have experiences with racial discrimination of that segment so in the pie chart to the right 82% of those youth were monoethnic, meaning the child of two Latino parents, which I used as a proxy for skin tone. So it was a rough proxy. I didn't exactly, you know, carry around a color palette when I was doing these interviews. So it's rough, but I think it's pretty accurate. Um, so that gives you another sense of um, how people are being treated and what's signaling um, differential treatment and how skin color as well as gender plays a role. So how am I doing on time? I should check in. Okay. So I've been making the point that gender matters, that skin color matters, so I want to talk briefly about how you combine them and they both matter. So we have some gendered images. We wrong button. So we have some gendered images. So by gendered, I mean how gender matters in these racial stereotypes. So you have gender and race uh, mattering. So the Mexican-American men tended to be seen as low status and violent and lawbreakers. So an example of that from one of my interviewees was a lot of times people get the impression that I'm a gangster or a cholo and they were getting that impression off of skin color, dark hair, shortcut. You know, when I interviewed him, you know, he pointed out the fact that he had a little scar, not from a fight, but people assume it was, you know, a bar fight kind of um, injury. Um, Ironically, he was, or maybe not, ironically, based on the assumptions he feels he was dealing with, um, he was a counselor at the local city college. And so he was wrestling with this issue of do I even bother to correct people when they're wrong? Do I give them that? You know, is that, is that correcting something or is that me kind of playing into the game? So again, these are issues that are pretty personal, they're pretty important, and these are issues that people who are granted, say, white privilege or granted equality off the bat don't have to wrestle with. So in terms of Mexican-American women, um, they tended to be viewed as exotic. Um, so we have, actually it was Jillian, the woman I was mentioning, who's, um, she's half white and half Mexican-American, and so she was going to school at the time um, at an East Coast private elite university um, that prides itself on diversity, and so she's saying that you switch contexts, and all of a sudden, suddenly it's cool to be Mexican, and she gets all breathy as she's telling me this. You know, it's exotic, I'm not just a white kid, right? So there's a little bit of a tokenism going on, and you add that to you know gender and all of a sudden she becomes you know exotic which you know on the face of it it might look like uh, this sort of treatment it's cool to be Mexican exotic seems like oh gee maybe it's not as nefarious or dangerous or damaging as being seen as a low status violent you know criminal um, which was often cast on men and yet you also ha in both you have objectification going on in the second you have sexualization going on um, and in both you have othering going on so I would argue they're they're both damaging just in slightly different ways again how gender also matters not just Latinos um, being Latino okay again feel free to get the hook if you need to um, so turning to book two um, which again was um, based on 109 interviews principally with couples, so Latino, Latino couples, as well as Latino white couples or Latino 
other non-Latino minority couples. Um, so I want to talk briefly about the shifting boundaries between racial groups, so how you see through these partnerships um, some of the boundaries between groups are moving. On the other hand, um, there's probably equal evidence, I would say, that there's solidifying or deepening boundaries uh, between groups. And I'll explain what I mean with some evidence. So, um, you know, that's a big question about where, what's happening with the racial boundary and the, and the racial boundary line. I think there's some shifting and there's, and there's some hardening. And I'll give you some evidence of both. So Travis Strong, uh, I interviewed him. Oh, wait, I don't want to reveal that all quite yet. So Travis Strong uh, is a Native American who was living in Lawrence, Kansas. And he expressed a deep and dear connection with Mexican people. Uh, saying that we are all brown people, as he rubbed his index finger along his arm to indicate his brown color. Well, I hadn't quite heard that before. I thought that was kind of interesting, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not native, and uh, they, you know, stereotypically, again, which I don't want to ascribe to, uh, are ta being talked about as, you know, uh, red or kind of according to a national or tribal group. If you think about the red power movement, um, that was a self-described uh, term at the time. So he's talking about being brown. So he tells me, uh, he's, he's married, by the way, to a half Native American, half Mexican American woman. And he tells me, we don't call Mexicans them. In our eyes, the Lakota eyes, they are our brothers and sisters. They are no different. They're Indians too. So they're Indians too harkens back to the indigenous ancestry of Mexicans in Montezuma's empire as well as a geopolitical history of colonization. So using the term brown people that refers to skin color, history, and politics rhetorically unifies then uh, natives and Mexicans. So draws this boundary in to include both natives and Mexicans in a non-white bigger group. So referring to another mixed race couple, Trinidad, Trinity Valencia, who's a biracial black white woman, uh, she talks about her uh, dating history, as she tells me. I was always attracted to men of color, even though I was surrounded by white men. Oh, she was in Kansas, by the way. Uh, my choices had always been, yeah, white men. Yeah, that's why. Had to throw that out there. Um, so, yeah. So she was attracted to men of color despite being surrounded by white men. My choices had always been men of color. So she actually had to choose men of color because there were lots of other white options. So what draws you to them, I asked. She said, just feeling like men of color would understand what it's like to be an other and that experience. So to give you a look at both sides of this marriage, uh, Trinity's husband, Rodrigo, felt the same. He tells me, both of us have had similarities in life, not so much culturally, but just life experience. So actually, the way in which they met tells you the degree to which they were aware of race and class as they met at a program over the summer that they were working at that serves um, under-resourced um, high schoolers who are trying to be first-generation college students. So capturing class and race disadvantage, life experiences is not only a bond for cross-racial marriage among non-whites, but also grounds for a bit of a, of a shift in racial boundaries. So again, this, this broadening non-white group that shares an experience of marginalization. So in the next few slides, uh, we will see family pressures exerted kind of down the racial hierarchy. And certainly there's, there's lots of, this is, you know, this is crude uh, in terms of generalizations because there's lots of, there's people in, at lots of different levels in this hierarchy. But if we're thinking strictly about race, if we envision whites at the top, Latinos somewhere in the middle, and blacks at the bottom, yet again, Latinos are a big heterogeneous group and they can be going in all kinds of different directions. I want to talk about how family pressures are, are exerted down the racial hierarchy. So you have whites exerting anti-Latino and anti-black pressures, and you have Latinos exerting anti-black pressures. And this is in terms of family formation, so this is about dating. So yes, the families of non-Hispanic whites discourage their kin from romance with someone lower in the racial order in order to maintain social distance. and. Relative to African Americans, Latinos enjoy some racial privilege, and they also attempt to preserve this privilege by excluding blacks as romantic possibilities. So sorry, but Latinos are not off the hook in terms of exerting racism. <laughs> 
So moving to interactional forms of discrimination that solidify racial boundaries. First, I'll talk about anti-Latino discrimination uh, deployed by whites. And here we'll talk about um, Nathan Lucero, who was uh, a Mexican-American that I interviewed in Lawrence, Kansas, who was reflecting back on, his peri on a period in high school when he faced threats of bodily harm from his white girlfriend's father. The white girlfriend's father said, uh, just kidding, he's telling me that her dad hated me. He didn't give me a chance because I was Mexican. She came out when I arrived to pick her up for a date and said, my dad wants to know if your car can outrun a bullet. Such threats are an aggressive way to police the symbolic boundary between whites and Latinos. Nathan noted that he was driving a decent car as he's telling me this story, preemptively asserting his financial stability and ruling out class status as the reason for, his, for her father's extreme measures. So non-dominant classes, as in non-whites, can also protect their relative privilege. The aim of anti-black discrimination, coming from Latinos, is to avoid slipping down the racial ladder, as it were. There's also a gender angle here, where women reported more surveillance by family and peer groups than did men, right? So, men, so gender still continues to matter. So Noel Puente, a Mexican American from Kansas, tells me that I knew that dating somebody black wasn't gonna go anywhere. I ended up at a bar that my uncle showed up at, and my uncle actually followed us out. Then he tried to beat my date up. Then I was confronted by my dad, and he tells me, you have a choice. You either choose your family or you choose him. Noelle never dated the black man again. This formative family experience lies behind Noelle's assertion that I knew that I would not marry somebody African American, yet knowing that she would not marry a black man did not occur in a vacuum. Right? There were experiences that led up to that conclusion, and it was family, racist family pressures that did that. Um, also, it's interesting to think here that this is a woman who's being threatened with excommunication from a family, and might it shake out differently if it were a man? I don't know, um, but interesting to consider. So as a note, the majority of those who did date blacks were darker skinned. So it was darker skinned Latinos who, um, and at least in my small sample, dated African Americans. So, also, generation that I talked about in the very beginning matters. So, we know from a lot of sociological literature that intermarriage incre increases over time in the United States. So, immigrant generation tends to marry within the same national origin group, but by the time you get to the second, third, and later generations, they tend to marry outside of their uh, racial or ethnic group. Uh, yet, the immigrant generation tend to exert tends to exert pressure and expects within group marriage for, for their children. So second generation Mario likens interracial intimacy to homosexuality to underscore the transgressive nature of such a pairing. So he tells me, when I used to bring home a black girl, I would never bring her around my whole family. Just say a few tias who I thought were cool. It's almost like you're gay, kind of, like you're coming out fantastically interesting, right? So it was that transgressive a barrier that he was very, very careful and again, these formative socializing um, experiences do actually matter. I, you know, I don't think it's by accident that he ends up marrying a, a mixed ethnicity woman who's Mexican American and white. Right? She got along with the family, she wasn't fluent in Spanish, but she, under, you know, she understood some of the culture and participated in it. Okay, back to skin color, but this time relative to marriage. So family members, um, in this is again about the second study, family members pushed lighter skin Latinos toward exogamy, so toward um, outmarriage with non-Hispanic whites in order to whiten the race. So this one woman was told, oh, congratulations for dating whites. Uh, she was also told by that same, you know, by members in her family, well, dating a Mexican-American, that's kind of status quo, because she was Mexican-American, and much like we heard with Noel, dating a black man, that's a no-no, unless you want trouble with your father. So it was the, also the light-skinned Latinos who are more likely to intermarry with whites, so that's why there's probably more encouragement uh, there, it's kind of, it is justified, there's kind of a positive feedback loop there. Uh, then family members of darker-skinned Latinos encourage same-race romance, 
which actually, if Latinos are encouraging other Latino family members to date and marry other Latinos, that, in, that avoids African Americans, right? Especially if you're dark skinned. So this would come out in terms like, look for your own kind, marry within, chickens go with chickens was a creative expression I heard. So while we have seen that there's variation in terms of historical moment, generation, gender, and skin color, ultimately it's in how US society treats Latinos and how Latinos react to and interact with others that we see possibilities for interracial relations in our communities. And I'll just summarize briefly some conclusions before moving on to a few things to think about, and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, so in terms of briefly summarizing some of the key points from uh, today's talk, we've covered a spectrum of incorporation trajectories among families who do gain middle class status, so you do have that upward mobility. Um, at least among people that I interviewed, so it is happening. So even as people become structurally integrated into society, they're getting educations, getting solid occupations, um, sometimes even also intermarrying, you can have a variety of ways of expressing your racial and ethnic background and culture, so thin detachment and cultural maintenance. Historical era matters, we saw in the Lopez family, about the relevance of earlier assimilation programs, the civil rights movement, affirmative action as well as kind of the general multicultural uh, kind of ethos for today, of today. Uh, we certainly saw a lot about skin color, upper mobility we talked about. It is occurring, albeit slowly, and over generations. Uh, we saw that in the Lopez family, um, as well as some of the racist kind of blockades. So racism, we also saw that that's occurring. And it's harshest against some subpopulations, if we think again about gender and skin color and historical era. And I think all of this, hopefully, um, makes us think about and become more aware of what's going on in the world and helps us hopefully make sense of perhaps some of our own experiences um, and helps us think about how we might be able to work together to try to remedy some of these social ills and work together for social justice. And then there's certainly a lot of relevance in terms of what's going on in the world and in the nation today in terms of how we might apply some of these concepts uh, or some of these ways of thinking to um, today's more um, uh, current events. So we have a lot of police brutality against blacks. What about Latinos? There, I've heard some of them in the news, right? So Pasco, Washington. Uh, so what about Latinos? Where do they fit? How might we agitate, mobilize? Um, does it make sense to go in with the blacks um, and part of that Black Lives Matter or does that dilute a cause uh, for uh, people who might claim to be brown, not necessarily black? So we need to think also about the pros and the cons, so the advantages or disadvantages of Latinos integrating into a broadening white category. Also, what are the pros and cons or advantages or disadvantages of Latinos integrating into a, a broader non-white category? We saw that shared marginalization was important for some um, cross-racial but non-white uh, partnerships. So, um, what does, so how accurate is that as a broadening white category or a broadening non-white category? And what does that make invisible? What does that miss? Uh, certainly, it's always important. I know I didn't touch on it that much in the talk today, um, but legality, it's always worthy of considering um, what immigration laws or what police treatment is telling us about who is worthy of being considered part of the nation. I mean, fundamentally, I think that that's what's going on in terms of uh, laws. I always tell my students, and I hope I get some shock faces in here, because I always get shock faces when I say this, uh, in my race or immigration or social inequalities classes, that in 1970 there was the uh, a Naturalization Act, that it was only free white persons of good moral character that should gain entry into the United States. Free white persons of good moral character should enter into the United States in 1790, and that passed in Congress without debate. No question. No conversation. Uh, also, we should think about intergroup coalitions. So, like I was kind of referring to up in the uh, top point here, about what are some of the similarities that different racial groups um, have and how might we kind of gain from joining forces. On the other hand, you know, what might that take away or how do agendas differ? So, are there different goals and might there be something that's lost and, you know, how might we identify um, where we can join forces and where um, there also needs to be perhaps a separate call to action for particular um, 
Latino group or Latino subgroups. So I will leave it there, and I'm happy to uh, have Cheryl come back and facilitate Q&A. Thank you very much. We are going to have a couple of mic runners, so if you have a question, let her rip. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was very informative. Oh, good. Thank you. My name is Margaret Serenabanetti. You touched upon so much here. Yeah. I see one of the things that you may have touched on, but, but you, you probably uh, didn't go into it, is even the way that Latinos marginalize each other. Yes. With the whole La Negra, El Negro, La Huera, La, oh. you know, yep, yep, all yep, yep. of that. Right? Absolutely. Which yes. has a lot to do with self-esteem. Yep. But I'm going to go off into this last part that you were talking about with the uh, police brutality. Yep. And, as you know, Salinas has been on the map. Yep. with uh, police officer involved shootings have been um, very very much involved in that the whole black lives matter uh, the whole black lives movement has received so much attention and I look at that as something that's been going on for a very long time that uh, the uh, the black culture basically they have nowhere left to go they have been pushed right so far with the Latino culture we have all of this separatism, mm -hmm. those who do not want to be included with the black culture, mm -hmm. those who don't even really sometimes want to be included with the Latino culture, mm -hmm. and then we have the immigrant population, mm -hmm. which yep. is very much in the shadows. And so therefore, they don't want to speak out, they don't want to come out of those shadows because fear of deportation, loss of employment, and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, the whole generational, which, um, you know, I've been here a long time, you need to have respect, police officers are great, and then mm -hmm. that whole tiered. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you see? Yeah, that's Is a, a, way a to lot coalesce? in that question. So, what's that? A way to coalesce all these things together. All the themes? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, yeah, that is a big question. I think, I mean, if we strip away perhaps some of those differences and get back to the what those different con constituencies you were talking about share um, you know sometimes it's hard to bridge differences and to see actually I've got issues as a brown person too even if I'm lighter brown or even if I'm you know uh, authorized in the United States or born here or whatever so I think it is challenging right if you have language differences education differences um, community differences, even you know, church differences, um, class status differences, where you are in school. So I think that that's really tricky, and I think that's a really good, broad-based question for people to consider. I mean, I think if you just strip away all those differences, there still is a fundamental need to um, kind of gain more respect in general popular society as Latino people. Um, and how you achieve that, you know, I think part of it is going through, you know, political legal channels and trying to get, um, you know, immigration reform, which is, you know, a highfalutin idea and, you know, at least we have DACA, but we don't have as much as we should, I think, uh, in terms of immigration. So, yeah, I think part of it's incumbent upon all those smaller constituencies you were talking about to see that there is a cause and there is a potential reward for, um, linking up with other people in your same broader category for the same general purpose. And I think sometimes people get siloed, not through their own fault, but just through maybe, you know, again, a language difference or a social circle difference or a class status difference. It's harder to break out of that and to see actually there is something to be gained by uniting as, you know, a, a Latino population um, that does want to be, you know, say, brown and proud, for example. So I think that that's tricky. I think that there's a lot of work that we need to do and think about, and I hope that's at least the beginnings of an answer, but I realize it's probably not as comprehensive as I might want to give. Thank you. 
Hi. Um, thank okay. you so much for explaining this and putting this into words um, with the things that I've been thinking for a very long time. Oh, so, thank um, you. That's a great compliment. My name is Jermaine Esquivel. I work with YWCA, but I also identify as the Avion culture, the Avion generation. And um, it's, so as I'm, as I'm hearing this, I, I can relate very strongly on, on some of these um, stories. But as you were kind of um, explaining the first generation, the second generation, and the third generation, um, I'm also oddly reminded of a population in Southern California, um, and it's the Kamai culture. Mm. So the Kamai culture um, from, from the 70s um, had to come to um, the United States in Long Beach, just so happens to be the highest population of Kamai people um, outside of Cambodia. So that said, their first generation were these people who had came by as refugees and had suffered um, a vast genocide. Mm -hmm. And um, they had told the stories of their ancestors to the second generation. And um, oddly enough, the second generation are the people who are about my age that can relate to the hardships of first generation people, but want to have the best for this next generation to come. Yep. And so the third generation nowadays doesn't really relate. In fact, a lot of mm. the second generation don't even tell the stories of their ancestors because they don't want that, they don't want to recreate those stories again. Wow. Um, they, yeah. they want to try to assimilate more into American culture. Yep. So the third generation is forced to um, live a life that's more um, kind of tech savvy and not necessarily relating to um, ethnic background. Yep. So sure. I'm seeing these kind of parallel um, Great point, formations yeah. here that are happening between generations. And that being said, what do you anticipate for this fourth generation to come then? Oh, good question. Wow. I would say just off the bat, more diversity, more kind of splintering in different directions that people can go in. Um, because at that point, um, from the culture that you're talking about, um, I'd also note there's a big difference between being a refugee and getting some state assistance and, and not in terms of being an economic migrant um, and not getting state um, aid and support. Um, I, I suspect that given that we're already dealing with, you know, in my terminology, thin detachment and cultural maintenance and that sort of spectrum, I think there's going to be even more of a proliferation of kind of different ways of being. And I think there's a real tension in the way that works out in families. Like, you know, that could work to marginalize the first generation and make them feel like they aren't as valuable if their stories aren't being told anymore, right? But if it's in the interest of the third generation to be, you know, if they're being enticed by, you know, the latest iPhone and iPad and this and, you know, this and that, as well as, you know, opportunities that no doubt their parents and grandparents didn't have, um, I think that that can kind of reverberate in pretty difficult ways within the family and, you know, create potentially, you know, difficult relationships. You know, I just, I mean, for my own part, I mean, I, I felt like one of my, the best compliments my grandmother ever gave me was, you know, well, Mia, you know, you're very well educated, and yet you speak to me in a way that I can understand. And I just thought, I love you, Grandma. You know, like, but that, that, I knew that she was saying something meaningful to me, right? You know, it was about not losing that connection to her and my background, and I'm not fluent in Spanish, but it wasn't about that. It was about trying to, you know, create or maintain, you know, family love in a way that didn't look down on or disgrace, you know, people who had different opportunities and different, you know, we're living in his different historical eras, much like we talked about. Um, and I was a beneficiary, and I saw that of a lot of the hard work and tears and toil of, you know, my grandparents, for example. So that's probably veering on the personal way to try to answer that, but I think there's probably going to be a lot of um, kind of even greater differentiation. Um, that being said, there's, I don't think it's been, you know, tested exactly, but there's a theory out there in sociology about, uh, it's called the third generation return, so maybe there'll be a fourth generation return, meaning that uh, the grand child, or in the case of the fourth generation, if it hasn't happened in the third generation, the great grandchild wishing to remember what the great grandparent wished to forget. So there could be that sort of cycling back, and I don't know what it would take to take either route, um, but sometimes it, it takes uh, some distance to then get nostalgic about something you no longer have. But and at that point, it's even complete disconnection. Exactly, exactly. So it could, I don't know what the factors might be that would kind of route 
families or entire generations in one direction or another, but I think all of these are possibilities. You know, I'm not above saying that while I think things are very much patterned, I mean, I'm a sociologist, I look at patterns and groups, yet I think personalities also play a part in terms of who is inclined to be close to whatever ancestor and hear those stories and retain that versus, you know, who's a little bit more you know, out for individual gain or just gets enticed by the different, you know, what's in front of me now um, kind of opportunities. So does that it does. get Thank out you your so question? much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi. I should probably talk to you too. I was once involved in a study on Southeast Asians in Oakland and Richmond. Um, but I was just going to comment on your um, wonderful presentation. I'm Thank a qualitative you. researcher too. Yay! And I go to one that kind of has a little edge of social justice to it. It's a qualitative or international qualitative um, conference down in Guanajuato, Mexico. Wonderful. Um, Love Guanajuato. It's coming up next year. <gasps> it's every is. two years. <gasps> It What's better it be coming because I'm going to go again. Fantastic. Um, but the last one I went to, there was a wonderful presentation done um, that it was done down in Mexico. I can't remember which state, but it was mm. not quite the deep, you know, the very south, but you know, mid mid Mexico somewhere. Um, and they asked a bunch of children. So I think they were between like maybe five and eight. Great stories, and you know, they had to have different type of characters and. The way that, you know, that the outcome of the results was that, you know, there was that pecking order. The good ones, the heroes, the heroines mm. were ranked by gender and then color of the skin. Mm -hmm. So you had the white, the lighter skin males on top and then the lighter skin females and then the ones who were the troublemakers um, or whatever were the yeah. darker skinned um, males and then females. So there was definitely that rank and I... You know, I think that would be a study that you'd be interested in too. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yep. So to There's look a lot up the conference proceedings. <laughs> Interesting. What is the conference called? Oh, gosh, I know that if it's the website is something like Qualitative GTO for Guanajuato. Oh, Guanajuato. Okay. Um, but it has like a different. You can't just do it like that. Um, but it's International Qualitative Research Conference, I think. Cool. I can look. But that. if you Thank do you. that and put in Guanajuato, you should find it. Okay, good. But yeah, and that gets to the point that someone else raised too about the intergroup uh, racism, right, or internalized racism too, and the yeah, various so they, forms of stratification even within the group. Right. And you, there are other similar um, talks like that down there. So there's a, there's a lot of anthropologists and sociologists and Excellent. ESL teachers. Fantastic. Good group. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully I'll see you there. Yeah, that'd be fun. Thank you. Hi. Oh. Hi. Um, I thank you very much for your presentation and your research. My pleasure. And, thank you. Um, I really resonated with your concept of the thin detachment and um, the cultural maintenance. And what stuck out for me is um, I'm actually an adoption social worker mm. here in Monterey County. Wow. And so uh, more often than not, we're um, working with uh, uh, adoptive parents who are white and because we're here in Monterey County most often they are adopting children who are uh, Latino descent mm -hmm. so um, we talk very and, and you know prepare our, our, our uh, adoptive parents about how to honor you know their children's heritage their culture um, and how to uh, help them identify as being Latino as being adopted you know and their whole adoption story. Um, but I wanted to specifically ask if you have any insights or um, suggestions for how to better prepare our adoptive mm. parents with how to you know, address those situations and um, be able to prepare their children for being not only identified as being in a, a mixed you know, um, family of origin, but um, their identification as being Latino or Hispanic. And um, especially from, you know, beyond food and music and, you know, those kind of cultural mm -hmm. indicators, um, but how to help the children identify who they are in their racial identity, especially when they come from their birth family who may be in that thin detachment or, mm -hmm. or third generation where there isn't that, you know, um, cultural history that's rich from the family of origin, let alone coming into now a white family. So I'm just curious about your thoughts about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. That's great. I mean, I guess my big kind of bold letter answer to that would be just to tell people and support them in understanding that there are lots of ways to be a Latino person, right? I mean, I think that gets sort of missed. Um, sometimes we, or people generally, um, 
can kind of boil down a kind of essential elements, um, like you were saying, kind of, you know, culture. And that's, that's certainly one of the more, you know, basic ones. But culture is huge. Does that mean, you know, language? Does that mean food? Does that mean religion? Does that mean, um, you know, ways of dress? Um, does it mean dance? So I would just encourage you to support people in understanding that there's, there's not one way to be an authentic thing. I get really annoyed with these battles of authenticity thing. I mean, in part because I failed plenty when I was a kid, you know, so I'm probably failing plenty now. Um, so I would, I would step away from what might end up being um, a battle for authenticity, and I would just allow people and support them in being whatever sort of um, Latino they want to be. I mean, I think that actually helps disentangle cultural practice from a face or a body. Um, this is a slightly different point, but I think it'll, it gets in there tangentially to what you were talking about, that it was fascinating when I was doing interviews with, it was particularly Latino men, uh, husbands, who were married with white women, wives. Uh, the point being that these families sort of divorced uh, racial status from culture. And so what happened, there was this kind of gendered imperative for the mother, white mother, uh, or white spouse, um, to kind of be the keeper of the hearth and the home. Well, I had a lot of women who were telling, white women who were telling me, well, there's not really a German or an Irish or Scotch-Irish community that I can kind of connect with here in the, you know, what, my local community. And my, it, plus I'm a mutt, like I'm a white ethnic something. Um, but my husband, now he's Mexican origin, and he's Latino, he's Hispanic. Well, in, in Kansas, actually, the term is Hispanic. So, uh, but he's that, it's identifiable, his family's here, we go to the Catholic Church. And so what was happening is you actually had um, white women who were affiliating with their husband's background, and they then started to transmit not their own heritage, but a heritage that they adopted at the point of marriage which is fascinating, right? So I think that that's not unlike what you're talking about with the adoptive parents and the adopted children, um, where you know people can kind of practice various things. And um, I think by kind of stepping back from this idea of you know, authenticity or what people should be and you know how many boxes they should check off to you know satisfactorily be a such, such and such, um, that I think that that should be hopefully empowering, um, as long as you know people do it with you know sincerity. So, does that help? <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello. Oh, cool. Hello. Um, kind of to go off your question, there's a book by a dude named Torre. It's called Who's Afraid of Post-Blackness? Um, and it talks about like the different, like no matter who, if, as long as you're black, whatever you do is black. And I think that's just saying like, no matter what you do as a Mexican, you are Mexican. I think the best, and I'll ask my question after I say this. Cool, yeah. The best way to imagine that is, has everyone seen Family Matters in here? Um, you know how Steve Urkel jumped in the machine and became someone else, but every time, even though he identified it with, um, you know, a, a specific culture, he was still black when he came out. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the way to think of like post brownness is that no matter what you do and who you are, you will always be a brown person. So folks yeah. will be like, oh, black people can't swim. Well, now I can swim, so I'm a swimming black person. Yeah, now, look at that. Now that, now that is a part of blackness, swimming. And so what you do as an Hispanic when you tear down some of those walls now becomes a part of brownness. So I think when we explain that and tell them that, um, you know, when we get to that point, folks will start identifying, okay, I can be Mexican and be smart. Or even though I'm light skin and there's certain things attached to my identity, it doesn't um, yep. take away from my brownness. Um, but my question was, in your interviews, did you... Um, interview any um, Afro-Latinos. Oh, and, sadly, um, no. Okay, can you I kind wish. of... Oh, you wish. Oh, you I said I wish. Oh. Yeah, no, okay, so my problem was where I was doing the research. So, mm. Kansas for one. Uh, <laughs> I know everybody always laughs. Yeah, so actually there are Latinos predominantly Mexican origin in, Can Mexican origin in Kansas. Um, they're few, right, but they're there. Um, actually, that was one of the funniest moments when I asked a... Uh, Mexican-American woman, you know, well, so how'd you end up marrying a white guy, right? And she was like, well, I was related to all the other Mexican-Americans in my hometown. <laughs> I'm from Southern California, right? And so I'm like, interview her face, interview her face, do not express shock. And I was like, oh, really? That's not an exaggeration? She's like, nope. It was the Garcias, the Sotos, the Ramirez's, and the, you know, whatever. You know, <laughs> it's like, 
Alrighty then. She's like, by butter, by marriage, and I can't, both were taboo. I'm like, okay. So no, so, and then um, LA County, which I'm sure there are Afro-Latinos, but there are certainly more in the southeastern seaboard, and I didn't go there, nor did I particularly, I, I kind of reached my saturation point when I was in LA and didn't actually capture any. So that is the failure of the research project, but there's more research in my future, so. Yeah, but you were gonna ask something else? Um, well, I am a former foster youth, and I was going to ask a question similar to hers, but she took it. Um, I was taking some notes while you were talking. Um, hmm. Okay, so you talked about um, how brown lives, black lives matters, can how brown folks can integrate or um, be a part of that. Can you talk about how how it worked in the red power movement in terms of like Latinos? Um, associating with um, the Native Americans. I know they have a historical connection, um, but how were they able to, I guess, racially re-identify into that movement? So what I, so I don't actually know about, you know, activating within the Red Power movement so much. The, the data that I have was more based on Travis Strong and his wife Penelope Rio that I was talking about. And they were awesome though. And of course it was helped by the fact that she was also half native, but they came from different uh, tribal nations. And actually she had a mother who went to, who was um, taken to one of the Native American boarding schools, which is not our boarding schools we think of now. It was actually a kind of strip you down from your Native American culture and you know forcibly assimilate you. Um, kind of Anglo conformity style. And so their marriage was helped by the fact, or their kind of collective brownness was probably helped by the fact that she was brown and, you know, quote unquote, red as native. So what I thought was really interesting in that couple and a few other people who fit that same kind of theme was that it was about having a shared kind of situation of subordination and that's what mattered. So being non-white is what actually mattered. And there were actually a couple people who were married to each other who were half white and half something else. So I have a half Latina or half Ecuadorian and half white white woman who's married to a half white, half Chinese man. And for both of them and both of their narratives, it wasn't the half whiteness that mattered. It was the half non-whiteness that mattered as a foundation for their relationship. And actually, and this was in Kansas too, which also shows you the kind of regional effect here, where they were talking about, well, you know, we're basically the same race anyway. Like, oh, okay, you know, Ecuadorian and Chinese. I didn't know that, you know, say more, you know? And she's like, well, we eat food that's not a part of the everyday American diet. It's steamed, it's wrapped, and like, Oh, okay, right? It's <laughs> um, but to them, it was about being kind of liminal in their families, having, a, having some non-white identity, dealing with a, uh, family elders who uh, spoke a non-English language. You know, so to them, that was enough to graft a non-white similarity that was a foundation for their kind of cross-racial marriage. So I think you had more in there, so tell me if I need to answer something else if I skipped. All right. All right, we finally got the hook. Yeah, right. thank you so much. <laughs> uh, as people are going out, they're saying, this is the best talk ever. Whoa, yeah, <laughs> thank you for so, having me. Um, for your friends, colleagues, neighbors, everybody was going out and saying, I wish more of my family was here. This is so relevant to my experience. Um, fear not. Uh, our friend Hibbert up there is uh, recording this, and so with Jessica's permission, I'm going to upload this to, uh, to YouTube. So. Uh, stay tuned and check out our Facebook page and that should happen pretty soon. So thank you so much for an amazing presentation. What do you think? <laughs> Dr. Vasquez is going to be signing copies of Mexicans uh, across generations and um, they'll be for sale outside, $25, and we have all of the other books available too. Um, Kelsey, where are you, you fabulous person, you? Okay, so this is Kelsey Sanchez. She is uh, our undergrad uh, intern from CSUMB, and uh, she is passing out a, a very short, eight question, one page evaluation with a self-address stamped envelope. You cannot go wrong here, folks. Two minutes, pop it in the mail. Let us know what you think about um, this presentation and the speaker series overall. Uh, hopefully we'll do this again. This was the first in the, in the series, and I have a feeling we saved the best for last. Thank you. So um, thank you all for coming out. Uh, get a copy of the book. If you get it on Amazon tomorrow, you're not going to be able to get Jessica to sign it. So uh, thank you and good night.